Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I have two announcements. First, I want to thank everyone who's already checked out Fiction Forge, and some of you have already written chapters, which is amazing. If we have any more budding writers in the community who want to help write a book with me, please go check out Fiction Forge in the description so we can write this book together. It's gonna be awesome. And I can't wait to read what the rest of you have to write. Announcement number two. At the start of the week, I did say that we had a little competition going on for any aspiring horror narrators in the community. Tomorrow is the deadline at midnight, so be sure to enter your submission of a 30 to 60 second narration to my email. But anyway, for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma, so not that long ago. Back in July, the ex and I had just finalised the divorce, and I moved into a gated neighbourhood where every house was rented out by the same rental company slash landlords. It's a very small neighbourhood with about 15 houses tops. All houses are bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. No one really has a fenced backyard. So when you walk out your back door, you see the lake in front of you and your neighbour's backyards on each side. Everyone in the neighbourhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly party or barbecue or having people over to watch sports. I was, and still am, depressed about my divorce, so I never took in these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next door neighbour Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare. My daughter Alice is four years old, and I get her every weekend. Alice's bedroom faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She truly is my everything, and I count down the days to the weekend, every week, just so that I could be with her. That's why I was upset when Irma came down, and I had to go almost three weekends without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mum. Then obviously the weekend of the storm, she was with her mum. And then on top of that, the weekend after she had to be with her mum because my power was still out and no AC in Florida is miserable. The humidity was so bad that week that I slept in my daughter's room the whole week because she has the only room with a window that faced the lake. I opened the window, exposing the window screen so that the wind from the lake could cool the room as much as possible as I slept. Eventually the power comes back and Alice starts visiting me again as normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady, and how she doesn't like her anymore. I thought she was maybe referring to one of my ex's friends, or one of the teachers at her school. Maybe there was a teacher at her school that sang to the kids that she didn't like. That Saturday night, Alice woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room and turned on the light and found her hiding under the covers. I asked her what was wrong, and all she could do was point into an empty corner of her room and say, Look! Look! There was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell the singing lady not to come back, Daddy. Please make it go away. Obviously she's having nightmares, right? I showed her that there was nothing in the closet and nothing under the bed, and there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell asleep. It couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before Alice comes running into my room screaming. She's back! She's back! Alice absolutely refused to go back into her room so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out to breakfast, and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. 
I haven't used one since her mum and I were still married. But I wanted to easily be able to hear if slash when she was having one of these nightmares again, so that I could respond quicker. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked, to give her assurance that I would hear her and that she was safe. And that night she slept soundly, and didn't make a peep all night. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again, because she caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night, and I was sound asleep in my bed. Around 2am is when I hear it. A woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming slash soft singing got louder and clearer as the voice got closer to the monitor. I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing lullabies in my daughter's bedroom. I had never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and disbelief. Then the voice spoke out. Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of my bed, locked my bedroom door, and picked up my cell and called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second as soon as I got off the phone, and I heard him storm out of his backyard screaming, Don't you move! I ran outside and found him aiming his shotgun at a woman, crouched outside my daughter's window, the one I had left open after Irma, and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognised the woman. It was Jean, the neighbourhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife comes running out after him and confirmed it was her. Jean played dumb. She said she was not singing and didn't even know my daughter's name. She said that she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol for gators and thought she saw one approach our house from the lake. Bull shit, lady. She was singing, and she called out to my daughter by name. Yes, it's true, there have been a few gators spotted around the neighbourhood. And yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night. But at 2am? I obviously knew it was bullshit. And even though neither Steve or his wife called her out on it, I could tell by the look on their faces that they didn't believe her either. The next morning I went over to Steve's house and thanked him and told him exactly what happened. He told me Jean and her husband have been known to be a little cuckoo, but this is by far the craziest thing to have happened so far. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. The park near my house has always had an impact on me. It's a place that I spent lots of my childhood at and have many memories here. Now most of these are fun memories. Ones of the fun times and goofy moments. But there were a few that were really bizarre. The first creepy story took place when I was little, either in grade three or four. This story never involved me, but it still produced nightmares and fear of the playground. My friend was hanging out at the park with his younger siblings and cousin, when a truck pulled up to the mailbox neighbouring the playground's entrance. The creepy man started walking towards the kids, and asked their names, where they lived, and their parents' names. The youngest started introducing them, but was stopped when my friend grabbed her signal to be quiet. For some reason, the man started to walk away after she stopped talking, and he murmured something that wasn't audible. The next time anything creepy happened was the time when my friend and I were walking around the forest surrounding the park. After spending about 15 minutes, we noticed a guy walking around the woods with his dog. It was normal at first, but he kept walking in circles, coming closer and closer to us. He always seemed to be looking in our direction, maybe even staring at us. But when we looked his way, he would turn to look the other. After 30 minutes, the man disappeared, presumably leaving the park, but it was creepy as hell. 
the final incident happened on the evening of my 14th birthday party. We were playing a large game of kick the can, and my friend, the same one from the previous incident, and myself, decided to take a trip to the park. We spent about 10 minutes talking about life, and school, and my birthday presents. But then we decided to head back to my house. As soon as we approached the street, we were noticed, and two of my friends sprinted towards us. We thought it would be funny to run back to the park. I ran into this small hidden playground area while my friend hid in the thick bush of the entrance to the deep woods. I was found and ran out, and it took a while for my other friend to run out. When he finally did, he seemed a bit uneasy. He then explained to me that after sitting in the bush for a couple of minutes, he noticed the figure of a man with long hair, staring at him with a sad look on his face. This terrified my friend, so he ran out. As you can see, this forest has always been creepy, and I'm just scratching the surface of it. I knew somebody who swore he saw a creepy guy hide behind a tree when he was walking down there, and I myself once found a rope tied to the tree to make it look like someone had hung themselves. To be fair, nobody actually did, but it's still odd, with all of the stuff that has happened previously. A few years ago, I was doing a high school project where I had to interview a figure I looked up to in my life about a trying time in their life. Naturally, I chose my grandma-like figure in my life, Marie, who took care of me when I was growing up. She was a robust 95-year-old double amputee with red hair that she would dye every Friday, though she would never dare admit to it. Marie was born in the 1920s to a very large family, under an abusive father. She never right out said she was, but she dropped some large hints. So to escape this toxic environment, she went off on her own and raised herself in her teenage years through the Great Depression with no family. It wasn't until years later, probably the 1990s, she was contacted by her only surviving brother, Buddy. He wanted to meet up and talk. So they did, and everything went well. When they did, he told Marie about how his wife died of cancer, and about his daughter, Carrie. They moved to the same area as Marie in the southern US, where Buddy would eventually die from old age. This left Carrie without a home of her own, so she moved in with Marie to help her adjust to life given that she had just gotten her first leg amputated in the early 2000s. It was no secret that Marie had money. So when Carrie heard of this, and thought that Marie had no surviving family, she likely got greedy and decided to stay with Marie with the thought that she would die, in order to get more from the will. We do not have solid legal proof that Carrie tried poisoning her. All we know is that Marie was in great condition but slowly got sicker and sicker as days went on. Doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong and just described it to old age. Aside from what Marie told my mother, she figured out that Carrie was messing with her and her food and kicked her out of the house. As soon as she did, she started feeling gradually better and eventually like normal. Carrie would go on to do some other shady type stuff that even more solidifies her poisoning theory. She lived in the same small town as me, alone in a small house on the edge of town after her late husband, Quinn, passed some years ago. So when her friend, my mother, had kids, she adopted me as one of her own. So when I asked if I could interview her, she was delighted and we scheduled to meet the next week for a few hours. When I came that day, I arrived to see that she had brought out pictures of her and her husband in Honduras, years ago, fixated on one of them standing together in a river cleaning. This is where her and our story will begin. Marie and Quinn used to live in the northern United States, 
They were married and stayed happily for many years. Until one day, Quinn told her that they would be moving to Honduras for his job. And so they did. They moved into a large house on the outskirts of a small village, with a river out back, deep in the forests of Honduras. For the majority of the time, there she stayed in the house, travelling only with Quinn after she learnt her first lesson the first time. She then went into a story about how one day, out of curiosity, she went out alone to a public meeting that went on every week, and she heard people talking about it. When she got to the centre of the village, she discovered to her horrors that these meetings were not public gatherings for discussion, but rather public executions. She painted an image of everyone in the village gathering around a large platform, where a few unlucky souls were lined and taken one by one by a large man. She described him as a hulking mass of muscles with scars covering his body, with a massive one across his face. This stern figure would take each person at the time, force them to their knees, and then take a large rusty hatchet and fulfil his name of the Hatchet Man. After seeing this, Marie would retreat home and stay indoors for months, only leaving on special occasions, such as when she would be escorted out to a nearby house to tell her husband something important. Upon arrival, she was taken upstairs and down a large hallway. When she entered the door at the end, she found her husband with several other men in suits that she described as Honduran officials, playing poker with a bathtub full of money in the room. Quinn scolded her for coming to find him, and she returned home. The next morning, she was sitting outside on her porch when a jaguar came down and started to drink from the river. She sat and watched it for what felt like hours. Before leaving, it looked at her and ran off. She then got the feeling it was time to leave. Coincidentally, the next week she was awoken in her room by a family friend in the middle of the night, expressing to her that something went wrong and that she needed to get out now. The woman handed her a note from Quinn that said a coop had broken out and that she isn't safe here anymore and they must leave before sunrise. The letter continued detailing directions to a field where a plane would be waiting for her to take her to the southern United States with only an address. She tried finding Quinn, but couldn't, and with only a few hours before dawn, she headed to the field. When she arrived, she saw a large empty knee-high grass pasture with a small two-person plane sitting in the middle. She approached the plane with only the guidance of a dim candle, and just when she was about to board, she felt two firm taps on her shoulder. Marie turned around to see a large figure looming behind her, the Hatchet Man. She described being immobilised with fear as a trickle ran down her leg. But before she could yell for help, the Hatchet Man said in a low voice, no, no, Miss Marie. Don't scream. I'm here to make sure you get on this plane safely. She got on the plane and left Honduras, never to return. She went to a small house on the edge of a small town and would not hear from her husband for several months, until one day when he randomly arrived to the door with flowers. Marie would later develop cervical cancer and have her reproductive organs removed keeping her and Quinn from ever having kids. Through this, and an eventual double amputation, didn't stop her from having a family, befriending a woman, and taking in that woman's kids as her own. She would die roughly 20 years later, leaving everything to her kids. And one other person, Carrie, a whole $100. To Marie, Thank you for everything you have given me. To the Hatchet Man, if you're still out there, thank you for your service. But let's never meet.
This happened two years ago. I was in the seventh grade, and since I wasn't old enough to stay by myself at home at the time, I went with my dad. I sat down and asked him for his phone so that I could watch YouTube. I remember me hearing the bell chime, signalling that there was a new customer, and since all spots were taken, they greeted her and told her it was about a 20 minute wait. Let me give you a bit of background about this shop. It's small but has about three couches for you to wait on, and I sat about 10 feet away from my dad on a couch so he could see me. The lady that just arrived, despite the fact that there were many empty couches, opted to sit right next to me. Now I like my space with strangers, but maybe she wanted to sit there for... You know what? I don't even know. So after that happened, she opened her purse and took out some pamphlets for some summer camp and poked me. I continued to watch my YouTube videos, and then she started tugging at my shirt. Excuse me, sir. I ripped out my earphones and said in a rude tone, What do you want? She looked at me, straightening her pamphlets, and asked me, Do you have any mental issues like depression or anxiety? I told her, No, as a very blatant lie because I do have anxiety. So she explained this camp. It was very shady and looked super expensive, and I had no interest, and gave her one word responses like, yeah, no, maybe. My dad could tell I was getting annoyed and told her to leave me alone that I was on my phone. I thanked him. But no joke, this lady gave my dad a death stare and told him that I'm old enough to make my own decisions. But like, what the hell's happening? I tell her to leave me alone and she walks out the barbershop slamming the door, screaming in cuss words. The barber tells me she comes there often and pulls the same crazy stunts. Sometime around the beginning of July, I got off a bus at Boise, Idaho. When you get off the bus in downtown Boise, you're already very near multiple shelters. The skate park, a mile-long bike trail, the library, the zoo, and also the river slash woods. It's a really beautiful area, in spite of the overabundance of undesirable characters. The first night I was there, I went from the bus station to the skate park, to a place called Piss Alley. At some point, a middle-aged lady pulled up and just randomly started talking to us for no reason. She wasn't a junkie, and she had a job. Yet, she stood there in Piss Alley and talked to us for about an hour about religion and conspiracies. I was high as hell for the first time in 10 months. A lot of her made me think that she was some kind of undercover, but I ultimately decided that she was just a little bit crazy. She had a job and a car and was capable of carrying on intelligent conversation. We really hit it off, even though we'd only just met. She asked me if I'd like to go camping with her and one of her girlfriends the next day. She definitely seemed more appealing than the street thug I was talking to, so I agreed to go with them. They were going to be leaving in the afternoon, and so she said I could come with her now, or she could get me later, after she picked up her friend from work. She took me out to eat, and we hung out at a park until her friend got off work. They made sure they had a tent and sleeping bag for me and we headed off to their favourite place to camp. Long story short, we went out there, we did camping things, we had fun, and we came back. I didn't get chopped into little pieces, but I also didn't get chopped up. It was about 11pm when she dropped me off back at Piss Alley. As I was getting out, this tweaker with long dreads approached the car. He was talking really fast, and he said, I'm not on drugs. I don't have any drugs. 
I got a couple of bucks and I got a couple of friends and we need a ride. We need a ride across town and we just need a ride real quick. I had barely shut my door by the time he had finished his pitch. The lady friend looked like she wanted to give him a ride, but she told him that she couldn't. He didn't hesitate to reiterate that he had a couple of bucks and he just needed a ride real quick. She was beating around the bush, explaining that her car was too full of camping gear and that she couldn't really fit them in the car. One of his friends was a girl who looked to be about 15 and he definitely was on drugs. I could tell because, well, so was I. He was starting to reword his pitch for a third time when I interrupted him. Being sure that I had his eye, I bluntly told him, Hey, no, she can't give you a ride. Then I waved her on and she pulled away from the curb, leaving him and I looking at each other in the eyes. I could tell he was pissed. I knew that in his mind, I had disrespected him. Right away, he fired off. Who the hell are you? Is that your old lady? Are you even from around here? Do you know who I am? I'm TK. Everyone around here knows me, and you must be brand new around here. You ask some people, they'll tell you. I run shit round here. He went on to talk about how nobody messes with him and how he's got everything. He was talking about how he's got shooters all over town and he can just make a call and somebody will show up and kill for him. I'm pretty used to people saying stupid stuff like that and I didn't act scared nor impressed. But I didn't scoff or mock either. I brought $20 worth of dope from him thinking it might calm him down. He pulled out a big bag of dope. He gave me a tiny little piece in the palm of his hand. We stared at each other down, and I asked him if he was serious. He yelled at me that that's what he gave me, and it would be all I needed. He was offended that I didn't trust him. A crowd had gathered, all of them staring at me with a look on their face that I knew meant they were waiting for me to make a wrong move. They all had his back. I put my hand on my knife, but ultimately I backed down. I popped the shard into my mouth like a pill and swallowed it. This was going very badly. I was seething. I could glare. But I knew if I expressed my anger with any major outburst, it was a result in me getting stomped. TK had his main few friends walk away about 15 yards and stood talking in a small circle. And after a few minutes, the 15-year-old girl came over to me and started flirting. I completely ignored her. This was obviously a trap. If he could make it look like I was disrespecting him further by so much as talking to his girl slash sister or whatever in front of all these people, he would gain more of their support, and there are about 20 in the alley now. I was starting to feel slightly paranoid. That shard was starting to kick in. If I was rude to this girl, that could be just as bad. So I answered a couple of her small talk questions with simple nods. She abruptly quit trying to be cute and walked back over to where TK and his friends were. He was on the phone. Next, a really big guy who might have been about 40, and another guy that might have been about 20, came up to me and started talking to me. The younger kid didn't say anything the whole time. He stood there with a glazed look over in his eye, like he was ready to kill. The older guy was a very tall fat man with a red goatee. He talked to me about mundane things, and went back and forth from being very nice to giving me the same stare that the young guy gave me. I could tell he was trying to see if I was scared, and was trying to see if I was an undercover cop. He was testing me in all kinds of ways, talking about crimes he had committed in the past, and looking at me in a very intimidating, hateful way one second, then talking neutrally, all about the corner store in a cheerful manner the next second. The two of them talked to me, one of them on each side, with my back to the wall. 
They were closer to me than they should have been. Everyone else in the alley seemed to be oblivious to us, but there were guys leaning against the wall at either ends of the alley, just staring at us. I had three bags, one of which contained my laptop. I had cash on me and was wearing a nice leather jacket. I kept my hand on my knife the entire time. I was trying to be respectful, but also to not look scared. I was starting to suspect that the shard I had swallowed was actually bath salts, because on the inside I was tripping balls. TK walked over and set his bag down next to my bag and started going through his pockets like he was looking for something in his bag. I was just trying to maintain eye contact with the big guy now. I had to watch to make sure he wasn't going through my bag too. I knew something was going to happen, and as soon as it did, I planned on flipping open the knife and sticking him swiftly and repetitively. If I could, I would try to keep TK between me and the big guy while I stabbed him. But if I had to fight right now, three on one would be only the first stage. There would be three or five or more rushing in right after me. The only thing that saved me is that I casually hinted that I needed to get some money from a lady who owed me, without saying it directly. I led them to believe that I didn't have any money on me, but would come back with more to buy some dope from them. Needless to say, I didn't plan on coming back. The rest of the night was very long, due to the effects of what I still believe was bath salts. I ran through the woods, and kept thinking I was being followed. I hid my bags in different places in the woods, so I could run without them if I had to. I was pretty scared, and pretty sure I narrowly escaped with my life, not to mention being high as hell. I came across a guy on the nature trail. He had a cloth bag in his hand, and when I asked him what it was, he said it was just something he found on the trail, and then he threw it in the bushes. He was tweaked out like me. He seemed to sympathise, and I told him the whole story of what just happened. He was going to take me somewhere safe to camp, where I could lay low. But I was unfamiliar with the area. So we were walking and talking, and the next thing I realised, we were heading right back to Piss Alley, and we're about a block away. I yelled at him and was like, What are you doing? I said I didn't want to go back there. He was saying it was cool and he knew these people and was talking about how he could make everything okay by just telling them I was a good guy. I turned around and walked back into the woods. I went back into the area where he threw the bag. I opened the bag and it was full of toys and not the kind that children use. Still tripping balls, randomly stopping to hide, stopping to listen to sounds for extended periods of time and trying to figure out where they were. I come across another guy. He's about 20. In the end, he helped me keep safe. He took me to an island where the river split around a piece of land underneath a bridge. I fell asleep there and woke up in the middle of the night to a random couple putting a blanket over me. I said thank you and fell back asleep. After a couple of days of getting used to Boise, I found out that TK had made national news. The same night that I had my interaction with him, the same night I stopped him from getting into the Christian lady's car. He had convinced a couple to let him sleep in their apartment. I could just imagine him telling them, just like he told us, I'm not on drugs. I don't have any drugs. At some point he started acting really weird, cracked out. They'd planned on having their three-year-old daughter's birthday party later that day, so they told him he had to leave, and he left. But when he came back, he stabbed nine people. Six kids, three adults. One of those kids was the three-year-old's birthday whose party it was. The people he was upset with weren't even there during the birthday party, but he got those kids anyway. He killed a three-year-old at her birthday party. What a coward. Over the next five months, 
I got more acquainted to Boise and its vagrant slash junky population. The people that had his back that night, most of them still missed him and acted like he never did anything wrong. When I went looking for the details on his case just now, I found out he will be getting the needle, but that a psychiatrist had almost gotten him off the hook. He won't actually be tried by a jury until 2020. That little girl is already dead. He should have been dead six months ago, or before it happened. I can't help but wonder if it was fate that put me in a position to take him out of commission just two hours before this happened. Yeah, I might have saved that lady from him getting in her car and doing who knows what, but maybe I was supposed to get him in that confrontation that never fully escalated. I knew he was dangerous. I knew he was evil, but all I did was get myself out of danger and look what happened. In the future, if I'm ever put in a situation like that, I honestly don't know what I won't consider taking action to be doing the world a favour. What if I failed fate? How am I supposed to sleep now? This happened this past Saturday at my bachelorette party. The theme of my party was boats and hose and took place on a lake surrounded by mansions as one of my best friends lives there. The day started off awesome. I was surrounded by a plethora of paper, chocolate, light up and inflatable schlongs. And we spent the day on the lake hooting and hollering and making all the other boaters laugh with our six inch blow up man poles. This is a really nice lake community, but they also like to party. So they're all in good spirits about the explicit nature of our voyage. Anywho, we go back to shore, happy that we made our presence known to the entire lake. The annual community party is in a few hours, so we get ready and shine up the old lads for another show. We head over to the party on the boat and try to bank the boat at the park where the party is. A couple of times, we were sure it pulled up far enough to not float away. So we roll in, the life of this snooze fest, and the desperate housewives and their bald drunk husbands are all about the D. It's a good time. We're working on an awesome guitar solo using my six inch willy when I smell someone behind me. Cigarettes, booze, and B.O. And I want to vomit. Creep is in a pitted out gray t-shirt and black baseball shorts, probably mid forties and definitely not a member of this upper class community. So you like dick, huh? I think my friend Willie is pretty funny. Yes. Note me being monotone with no eye contact or smiles, and I begin to walk away. I bet you like a lot of it, don't you? I give him a what the hell look. No. Are you going to use that on yourself later? I walk away quickly and don't look back. I find my girlfriends and tell them to be on creep alert. Next thing I know, he approaches my sister and asks her the same question. She tells me we were the gang and we were all on high alert. Then he approaches my soon-to-be sister-in-law. How old is the bride? She gives him a, are you kidding me? Look. And my friend Joan comes over to the rescue. None of your business. I brought my friends here to have a good time and you're creeping us out. Leave us alone. He then scurries away into the shadows. Not long after we see him and his friends watching us on the dance floor, we keep an eye on him. Luckily, the band is on their last song, and it's going on 2am, and we regroup around the picnic table for a while, and Creep is nowhere in sight. When we're all ready to call it a night, we walk back to our boat. We're confused, because we can't find it, until we notice that it's floating away. Someone had, minutes before, Push the boat offshore. A couple of the girls jump in after it, 
and that's when we see their boat off a ways with all the lights out watching us. We officially went from being annoyed to feeling threatened. The girls get to the boat and get back to us, and we're all on. The dark boat starts driving away down the lake. Crap. We have to get to the lake house that we're staying at. We give them distance until we can no longer see their boat, as they never turn their lights back on and head home. As we're docking in front of our lake house, we see the boat is coming up behind us. They snuck away and hid and followed us. Great. Now they know where we're staying. Well, I'm sure wasty pants at this point and I'm feeling brave. So I'm standing at the end of the dock as they coast slowly by and I'm staring at them with dead in the eyes. I'll see you tomorrow. And they're looking back at me in the exact same way. Screw this. We run inside, lock all the doors and pray we have no other encounters with these hillbilly Chernobyl creepy freaks. I know that gyrating around with a bunch of dicks isn't exactly giving off a nun vibe, but we're clearly having good hearted fun with the community and not dressing slutty or being flirtatious or anything. Ugh, I can still smell that guy. There always has to be someone to ruin the fun. It was a hot summer night. It was a rough time in my life because I was struggling to maintain my grades in school. And I had also been in an emotionally abusive relationship with my now ex-boyfriend, David. I'd been putting the finishing touches on my term paper that was due in a couple of days. When the phone started to ring, it was David. David wanted me to come over and spend the night with him. I contemplated for a little while, but I had this weird feeling in the pit of my stomach telling me that something bad was going to happen that night. But I brushed it off and thought it was just my usual anxiety getting the better of me and decided to just go because I was really bored. I freshened up and started to get ready to head over to David's house. While at his house, we watched a few episodes of reality TV, drunk a few beers and picked out on some snacks and had a great time. After a while, I go to use the restroom, when I catch David snooping through my phone. When I confront him about it, we get into yet another argument, because he always suspects that I'm talking to other guys, and this time, I was so fed up that I was ready to just be done with him for good, and him begging me to stay the night wasn't going to happen this time. Usually when I drive home from his house, he drives behind me in his car to make sure I get home safely. But this time I didn't want him to, because I didn't want us fighting in front of my house again, knowing the neighbours were getting all too used to it. I begin the drive home, and at this point I really need a cigarette to calm my nerves. I stop at a gas station for some smokes on the way. Now this is the type of gas station where you have to stand outside and order at a window. It's now three in the morning, and I pull into the lot of the gas station, and obviously my anxiety starts to kick in, once again. But then lightens up when I see cars and other people also there. I pull up next to the booth, where I always park, and go and stand in line. There's a guy in front, ordering his stuff. He turns around and looks at me, and gives me this wide-eyed, creepy-looking grin that made me a bit uncomfortable. In my mind, I'm thinking, what the hell? But I shrug it off. After he pays for his things, he begins to walk towards what I'm guessing is his car, which is at one of the pumps. As I start to order, I notice he keeps looking at me and he hasn't completely made it into the car yet. When I look over again, he's now facing back in my direction between my car and his and is pretending to fumble with something in his hand while looking up at me every few seconds. As I'm paying for my things, I notice him walking back towards my direction, and he asks me, Can you roll this joint for me? As I quick step to my car, I tell him, 
No, I don't know how. And in my head I'm thinking, gross. Who asks a complete stranger to put their saliva on something that they're about to place into their mouth? I click my key fob to unlock my car. And before I can open the door, he asks me again. Can you roll this joint for me? As I'm getting in, I tell him, No, I don't know how to. And before I close my door, he aggressively says, Get into my car. I slam the door shut, start the car. And I see him practically run to his car as I drive off as fast as I can in an opposite direction from my house because I don't want this creeper to follow me home, which is just around the corner. My phone began ringing over and over, but I was so shaken up, I ignored it, trying to get as much space between me and this guy as possible. After convincing myself he wasn't following me, I head home and walk as fast as I can from my car, looking around frantically, and rush through my front door, slamming it and locking it while shaking profusely. I made so much noise trying to get in that I woke my dad up, and he came rushing from his bedroom, asking me what all the commotion was about, and I told him what had happened. I was about to call David to tell him what happened. As it turns out, David had been calling me over and over. As I started to call him back, my phone began to ring again, and I jumped, nearly dropping my phone. It was David, and he said that he saw what happened, and followed me as usual, and parked on the street alongside the gas station, watching, and then he saw me speeding off, and tried to call me after he lost track of where I was going. After I'd spoken to him, he drove to my house and stayed in front of there for about 30 minutes before he left. He called to make sure I was okay, and told me that if he ever saw that guy again, he would snap his neck. My girlfriend works the overnight shift at Walmart. I have a regular full-time day job. Our time together can sometimes be slim, so we take opportunities where we can get them. I'm off on Saturdays, but she works. So I go up there on Saturday nights to hang out with her. Her job is pretty lax, to where I can just stand beside her all night while she stocks items. Well, one night I come to her Walmart, and she texts me, informing me that she's in the candy aisle. I go inside and walk to the very back of the store where she's at. We stand there talking, eating candy, doing our thing, and after about an hour I see this man in a motor cart wheeling past the aisle. He catches my attention because he rides back and forth passing our aisle, then coming back around. My girlfriend has her back to him, and she's going out on a tangent about some co-workers, and she doesn't even notice that I'm no longer listening to her, but watching the man behind her. After some time, the man disappears, and we go over to the next aisle, but then a couple of minutes go by, and the man on the motor cart drives to the other end of the aisle. My girlfriend, once again, is oblivious to what's happening, but I am on high alert at this point, and I know that something isn't right. He was all the way on the opposite end of us, but he stopped his cart, facing us, and just stared at me. We make clear eye contact, but he doesn't break his stare, He's an overweight man, probably in his late fifties, mostly bald with patches of hair around his head, and he's got eyes that bulge out a little. Definitely gives me the vibe that he's mentally impaired. I remain calm and pretend to be listening to her, but my eyes don't leave him. Eventually, he backs out of the aisle and leaves. He's gone for a few minutes before I start to relax, and my girlfriend and I get into another intense conversation when I hear the motor cart from a couple of aisles away. I immediately cease conversation and my eye shoots down to the end of the aisle. There he is, rolling towards us. My girlfriend and I are standing on either end of the aisle, so there's enough room for him to pull in between us and stop. He's so close. 
I can hear his heavy breath. I stare at him and he stares at me, never once looking at my girlfriend. A few moments that felt like an eternity go by, while we were just staring into each other, almost waiting for the other to speak. When all of a sudden he says, Anna? My heart drops to the floor. That's my name. My mind is going a mile a minute. How does this man know my name? Who the hell is this dude? I weakly mumble. Yes? He says with the same blank expression. Are you Anna? I stare at him in disbelief. Do I know you? His face changes as he has a disturbing look in his eyes, as if he knew he messed up, like he regretted revealing himself. Wrong person, I'm sorry, he says, before pulling away. Afterwards, my girlfriend and I just repeat, what the hell? I still have no idea who that man was or how he knew my name. It's possible that it was just a coincidence, but still. It was just too weird that he located a random girl in a supermarket and actually guessed the correct name. I never have seen him again, but I always wonder what that was. I'm sitting at a subway one morning, doing some work on my laptop. This guy comes up to me with a woman he claimed was on a day pass from a nursing home and proceeds to tell me about the abuse she's endured, and how she's got infected bed sores and is wearing a diaper. My initial thought is that he must have seen my scrubs and was asking me about this because I was a nurse. I realize I'm not wearing anything that showed I was in the medical field, and he was just an oversharer. I advised him to call a lawyer, trying to end the conversation. He then instructs her to take out her phone and show me the photos of all her infected sores. What the hell, guy? So she shows me the photos, and I maintain that they should be talking to a lawyer and not a girl sitting by herself at Subway. Apparently, not getting the reaction he's hoping from me, he forces her to pull her pants down and pull her diaper down and show me her sores and her lady bits, in the middle of Subway. I normally would be pretty angry, confused, and pretty much WTF about the situation, and told these people to piss off, but this guy is erratic. He's switching between touching me, yelling, and cursing. He isn't right in the head. So the woman pulls up her diaper, and after he's satisfied with the look I got, and then begins to hysterically cry, while yelling at her to not be embarrassed. I want to nope out of there desperately, but he's got me cornered, and I'm trying to plead with the woman behind the counter at Subway with my eyes to do something about him. At this point, his erratic behaviour is getting out of hand, and prior to even approaching me, had been yelling at someone on the phone, threatening the person to not piss him off because he's going to hurt someone. So I'm physically frozen, but still trying to defuse the situation and calm him down. Eventually, after about 15 minutes pass, after the crazy begins, he gets a phone call and switches to asking that person for legal advice, medical advice, and screaming at them. And I was finally able to confidently note the hell out of there. Beyond weird. This happened earlier in the fall. I was at a dog park in Vancouver with my mum. It's usually very quiet, and people are either friendly or they'll keep to themselves. It's a nice area with a brilliant beach, which my dog really enjoys. My mum has a tendency to draw the freaks of the world into conversation, instead of ignoring them or getting angry at them, and she actually tries to listen. She has hearing loss, so she tries extra hard to understand. Anyway, we're walking along the beach together and my dog decides to go number two. So I pick it up and start walking back to the park trash, 
which is about 50 meters back on another path. So my mum stays on the beach to watch the dog. When I'm walking back, I start hearing a man yelling and screaming. At first I thought, it's a dog, maybe mine. So I pick up the pace, and as my mum's luck would have it, she has this huge, beet red faced bald man screaming at her. My dog is barking at the man, and his dog, which actually seemed quite friendly, was just wandering around near the water. When I ran up and saw this man raise his arm as if he was about to strike my mother, I got in the way and pushed. The man was completely enraged, but I supposed he noticed I was younger and fitter, and walked off cursing me. Apparently, when I left to throw out the bag, the man had appeared in the distance, and when he got closer, he started accusing my mum of stealing his dog's stick. She said she hasn't moved from the spot, and it would have taken her a couple of minutes to wait for me. And when she told the man not to come any closer to her, he acted as though as he was going to hit her. The walk back to our car was a little tense, as I was almost certain we would run into him again. We never did, and I hope I never do. It really puts into perspective how anything can happen at any place. We still go, and I'm slightly hesitant to let my mum or sister go alone, in case they run into one of these guys again. Look after your families, everyone. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Do you guys follow me on Twitter and Instagram? Do it. Just do it. Just open your Instagrams and Twitters and, and follow me. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, let's see. Don't forget to enter the contest if that's something you're interested in. And if you like, you know, writing books, writing stories, check out Fiction Forge. Let's write a book together. I think it's going to be pretty cool. My wife and I watched Hereditary today whilst Pandora had a nap. You know, I'm going to be honest. I think good horror needs a lot of things. And although this film was beautifully shot, you know, it's a really good shots and camera angles and, and just, you know, transitions and done really well cinematographically, it failed so much on the story. I mean, it could have been a good story if they elaborated a bit more, dropped a few more hints, shortened it, done lots of stuff. But that sadly wasn't the case. So yeah, um, if, if you're thinking of watching Hereditary, I personally wouldn't recommend it. Um, maybe some other people actually really enjoy it. I don't know, I just feel like it doesn't build enough tension, not enough happens in, you know, the time given to justify it lasting that long, but that's just me. Maybe I just have high expectations. But I'd love to hear your thoughts if you've seen it in the comment section. Maybe I'm not the only person who's incredibly been disheartened by this film. If there's a story that you would like to share, feel free to send it to my email or Reddit. Either of those places are fine, and it hopefully could be in a video very soon. And don't forget to drop a like and subscribe if you're new, and press the bell icon if you haven't already to be updated every time I post. Every. Single. Night. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.